Matano Circus. Today we're going to be going over five builds that are in the 0.39263 shipping PTR version of Stormgate. Keep in mind this doesn't mean that these builds will be accurate when it comes to the Steam Next Fest. In fact, it's very likely due to a lot of complaints that people have had about balance and a lot of the games that people have seen that we will see a balanced state or that is very different in terms of other such things associated with Stormgate as we get into the Steam Next Fest and especially EGC in the 10k tournament. But I wanted to provide you these so that if you're still in the beta, you can use them. And if you're not in the beta, you can have some ideas to the strategies that strong players are attempting to use. These builds have been obtained from the Artosis and Mapu TV Super Cup that, according to Liquipedia, was started on January 2nd, and it shares the same version of Stormgate beta as what we saw with streamers such as Asmund Gold and then more recently Zombie Grub Nathanius and Winter Gaming. So, without further ado, the first build is going to be Parting vs. Mixu, Game 1, and from Mixu's perspective, it's going to be a fast expand. Stats are all over here. Uh, at 51 seconds and 8.12, you send one Bob for your command post, and about 10 seconds later, you go ahead and place down that command post. Note also that your scout has to be fairly active to pick up anywhere from 20 to 40 Luminite that is around the map on Secluded Grove. If your scout is not this active, you won't be able to place down the command post at these timings. At 123 you start your barracks, and at 201 your command post finishes. This is an important timing because when your command post finishes at your natural, you should have access to two Bob overcharges, each one lasting, at least in this version of the build, about 21 plus seconds, so you should be safe from any not fully committal attacks. At about 2.08, we see Mixu start a sentry post. Now, we didn't get a quite a defined timing on what was happening with when that sentry post would finish, because if we had, we would know that you could potentially change the order of the barracks in the sentry post. Part of the aspect we're doing here for build orders is that we're not putting down the information that happens after the players interact with one another in a meaningful way, because we don't know if the players are doing that because they know the other of their opponent's idiosyncrasies, or if it's a quirk of how they're playing the matchup, or if they're making some on-the-cuff, you know, off-the-cuff quick reaction. So... In keeping with the spirit of a build order, we want to follow things that are static and that we can potentially use going forward. I want to note that Mixu has had strong showings, according to the Liquipedia Stormgate page, on a variety of tournaments playing as Vanguard, and it's very likely that while this was not a strong showing at the Super Cup, that a build very similar to this was in fact useful for previous iterations. Therefore, you might see the Super Cup results and say, I don't want that build, but I would keep it in mind, especially since the balance is very likely to change coming into the open part of the closed beta. Next one that we're going to get on over here, right, is that we are going to get Parting's perspective from that exact same game. So this is going to be Pir uh, Parting's Iron Vault Expand. And it has a little bit more going on to it because the points of interaction are a little bit stronger. Let's go over, let's move this over a little tiny bit and see if we can't change this. Let's see, let's go ahead and do this. We're doing it live. And let's hit new. This is Parting's Iron Vault Expand. It changes a little bit from other Iron Vault Expands in that his plan clearly on Secluded Grove is to go for Gaunts. Right, uh, that's kind of the whole purpose of this build. You'll note specifically the timing of how imps are treated with regards to Therium makes this different than Theory's triple expand, which we will discover later on in this in, in this same video, in the same section of the Twitch stream. So Parting's Iron Vault Expand into Gaunts has everything here that's necessary. Note that the third base timing, which you may have seen was very fast in the game, was not present because of the interaction that it had specifically with Mixu's uh, timing and the damage that the Brutes did. I counted that as a reaction, so that part is not fully fleshed out. The, however, the rest of this is. So you get an immediate Iron Vault, and then you send 10 Imps to, to Luminite, and your 11th Imp should go over to Therium. Uh, once your Iron Vault completes, you know, as it finishes, you go ahead and you make one Brute. At 59 seconds, keeping in mind that there's a 10 second gap between your main Luminite section and the other base, at 59 seconds you send an Imp to your Natural, and 10 seconds later at 109, your Shrine at your Natural starts. I use the phrases Ara and NBM for as resources allow and no Bob Bolty build. Those things are unique, in fact, 
um, to Stormgate. So as resources as, as resources allow, after the shrine has started at 109, you want to make a meat farm. Now in the game, Parting places it in his main, but you could certainly place it at your natural if you feel that you need extra defense. As resources allow at about 138, because you have one person, one imp on Therium, and 10 on Luminite, you're actually going to get your second brute at 138. Then you're going to resume imp production, and you're going to send imps to Therium. Keep in mind that at this stage of the game, and in this build, people seem to have discovered that while you could have 12 people, 12 imps or bobs on Luminite, and 5 imps or bobs on Therium, the proper ratio is 10 on Luminite and 4 on Therium, after which there are decreasing and diminishing returns on your investment for their time. At 2.15, you're going to make a Conclave and your third brute at about the same time. Keep in mind that this is also about the point at which your first brute will be in a heavy micro battle on the other side of Secluded Grove, so you'll have your hands full. At 3.29, a Shadow Cleft goes down, and then at 4.30, you have double Conclaves. Note again that the timing of the third base wasn't mentioned here, as I believe that was a reaction to how much damage parting got done against Mixu's own Fast Expand on this particular game. Therefore, I don't want to tell you something silly like, your shroud stone in your third must go down at this time, independent of the game state that you yourself find yourself in. Once you get the double conclaves, you hurry up and get the hemoglave infusion, and you make brutes and gaunts in a 1 to 2 ratio. That means that for every one brute, you should have about two gaunts. The purpose of this army is simple. The brutes sit in front and tank and you know, absorb hit points and make it a nightmare for your opponent to just run up and do whatever they would like, and the Hemoglave Infusion Gaunts are going to attempt to clean out the rest of the game by infesting everything, killing them, and then turning them into fiends and getting excellent damage done. Keep in mind that if you've done a lot of damage with your initial three Brutes, well, you can go ahead and use them, you can use the Shroud Stone and use its first animus ability to infest, to give extra infestation possibilities during the initial fight with your Gaunts and your Brutes. If, however, you don't get a lot of damage done, you can have sent those Brutes off to various camps on Secluded Grove. Therefore, you might want to be a little less committal in your attack and look more for a third base. In the actual game, we saw that Parting did a lot of damage to Mixu, and so took a very aggressive third base, and only in the timing of all these things lines up, such that your double conclaves start and are, can be placed to block off your natural about the same time that your opponent, if they're doing a hedgehog off of a fast expand, will have it over at your natural. Let's go on to the next one, shall we? This is going to be Parting versus Mixu, uh, which is game number two. Right? We're going to go ahead and look up Mixu's build first. So, for those of you who didn't watch the game, Mixu's build was actually a proxy to Rax, or it's more like it was a one Rax proxy with the second build, or the second barracks, being built at home. Keep in mind that this is less committal, and this is Mixu's tactic on Broken Crown Hinterlands, the timing of which is displayed here in the video. <coughs> At 17 seconds, you start a barracks, and at 19 seconds and 29 seconds, you send bobs out for you to get across to about the halfway point of Broken Crown Hinterlands. Make sure the point at which you are going to build your proxy barracks at 1 minute and 4 seconds. One uses bob multi-build. You use both of your bobs to construct that building rather rapidly. And two, make sure you don't place it near the resource camps or the vision camp area on this exact map. You want to be able to do some damage. One of the benefits of having this less committal proxy to Rex is that if your opponent has an aggressive start themselves, your production facilities aren't hung out to dry across the map. We saw that Parting was able to refute this with a uh, with an Iron Vault expand. However, there were still opportunities for Mixu to get some damage done even after the proxy was immediately discovered. At 1.30 you make a habitat so that you can continue making lancers and other such units as you deem necessary out of here. Now the game ended shortly after this and a lot of reactions happened, so I didn't want to record too much information, as that might lead to you putting in something in your build that was a reaction to the game state from Mixu, and not something that you should be replicating versus AI. The next one you're going to have to bear with me, because we're going to split it up a little bit. This is Partings. Iron Vault expand into Gaunts on Broken Crown Hinterlands. I want to note also there is a point here at which what he is doing, what Parting is doing, is very much affected by the fact that his opponent is doing a proxy. Therefore, you should consider this when you are looking upon this build and thinking about whether or not it would be valuable for you yourself to use. 
So he makes an immediate iron vault and follows the same trend as previously, putting 10 imps in Luminite and then the 11th imp going over to Therium. Note that the 11th imp that you're sending over to Therium should be sent over there about the time that the scout of your opponent is getting into your main base. If you have sent over, if you've made imps in a proper rotation and you are sending the correct imp over to Therium, you'll know it by the fact that the scout will be particularly annoying to you at that point in the game. Once you have done that, you cease imp production, and then you go and on your Iron Vault completion, make one Brute. At 101, you send an imp over to the natural of Broken Crown of Hinterlands, and at 113, the shrine at your natural should start. Keep in mind that this means the distance between the main and natural points is 12 seconds on Broken Crown Hinterlands, where it's only about 10 seconds on Secluded Grove. As resources allow, you make a meat farm, and then as resources allow, you make a second Brute. There is, in fact, a second aspect to this build, which we're going to go over, right? So I want to note also that Parting has a very uh, interesting idea here. Let's go ahead and uh, expand this. So Parting actually takes a different map-specific approach to Broken Crown Hinterlands. If you've watched the games that have been played on that map, you know that that ridge leading over the natural is actually quite a bit of a pain point for the player who decides to get a fast, if you decide to get a fast third. Therefore, and it also seems to be difficult for Infernals to deal with low ground pushes with sensor towers aided by scouts and exos. Therefore, at 141, rather than go for a third brood and the shadow cleft and the conclave in a manner similar to what we saw in the previous game, Parting had a map specific and build specific reaction of building a shroud stun and meat farms to defend the natural ridge. It seems like, going off of other games that have been played of Infernal versus Vanguard, that the right number of shroud stones meat farms looks to be two and one. That is, two shroud stones and one meat farm if you are not in the mirror matchup. So, whether this is optimal or not or is hard to say, it's probably not a part of the normal build for parting and is, again, more of a map specific. Um, a map specific augmentation to the build and a reaction to his opponent cheesing him. In fact, throughout this series, parting sense of when he was about to be cheesed seems phenomenal and therefore it's hard to know without just knowing the mentality of parting as a player and what he was thinking at that time, whether this was a star sense sniff that Mixu would be proxying or a normal build adaptation. Keep that caveat in mind when you are adapting this build. We're going to go on to another one. This is going to be from Azure vs. Theory Game 1. Now, this is going to be one of the more expansive of the builds that we're going to talk about today. This is going to be Azure's Hedgehog Expand, and whereas most of these builds stop at a certain point because we're just dealing with too many unknown variables, as in how is the opponent reacting, what do they care about, what is the game's, like, what is the game's state in their mind, what are they focused on. What we're getting over here with Azure versus, uh, Azure versus Theory Game 1 on Broken Crown Hinterlands is Azure is essentially allowed to do this build fully uh, and leverages his micro to make it possible. Now, after this point, things get a little bit dicey for him, but I want to note that this is a very excellent start for Broken Crown Hinterlands, and it also has a good interaction with what Theory is doing on this map. So the Hedgehog Expand looks as follows. At 24 seconds, you make your barracks. Uh, NBM means no Bob multi-build, by the way. You, at 24 seconds, you make your barracks, and then you move three bobs to Therium, and you continue making bobs and sending them to Luminite. Keep in mind that you are not going to be fast expanding. Therefore, going over the 10 of 12 soft cap that people have been using for Luminite mining is actually good in this case, as it means you can transfer over more bobs to your natural command post once it finishes. At 110, you're going to create a mech bay, <clears throat> and you're going to use uh, the th a Therium bob. Again, you have three bobs on Therium, you now move one of them over here. Keep in mind that the timing of this mech bay is also, as with all Vanguard builds, affected by the ability of the scout to pick up Therium and Luminite across the map. So if you find yourself trying to do this versus the AI and your heart's stuck in your base, and no matter what, you cannot squeeze it out before two minutes and one second, you may want to consider that the map pickups that the scout is getting are allowing this build to come out a few seconds faster. You have continuous bob production, and then you send, after you 
you make the mech bay, you take all but one bob from therium and put them into luminite, and you have continuous bob production and send them into luminite. It's fine if you go up to 12 of 12, 13 of 12, or even 14 of 12. And you're going to make three hedgehogs as your resources allow, which should be continuously. Uh, the timings are here for when the first, second, and third hedgehogs finish, but what you really need to know is that right before the third hedgehog is going to finish, at about 323, you should be going to expand. Now, in the game itself, we see that the... Uh, we see that uh, Azure actually sends a whole fleet of mobs to make sure that he is not stopped up by any early fiends or just a, a pack of small fiends going over and killing the bob in question. So bob multi-build is also encouraged here. Now, here's where things get tricky. At 426, you're going to pull two bobs from the, towards the low ground of the enemy natural, and you start pulling them at 426 so that they can get there. As soon as they get there, the first one needs to be starting a sentry post and then with bob multi-build, and then as resources allow, starting a second one. Here's where, again, the curiosities add up. So... At 4.58, you need to move a scout, whether it's one that you've made out of your bio, can, out of your barracks, or if it's the one you started the game with. That needs to go down and join the bobs that are attempting to build the sentry post down at the bottom side of the map alongside your three hedgehogs. Once the first sentry post is done, you need to have an exo that is moving down from your main base at about 5.15 to go there as well. The purpose of this is twofold. You need the sentry post so that you can get the... Uh, basically a sensor tower, so you can see up the high ground of the enemy natural on this map on Broken Ground Hinterlands. The second one is going to be a very forwardly placed sentry post that once an XO goes inside of it will wreak absolute havoc on your opponent Vanguard's imps, aka their worker line. Then at about six minutes while all of this is happening, in fact almost exactly at the time that your XO is going to be getting into the sentry post and start shellacking uh, all of the imps over at your opponent's natural, you're going to send a bob from your natural to the low ground. We're not debating whether or not this is a good play or this is the optimal base choice. This is the build order that was used by Azure. And then at 607, it has a much smaller distance from the natural to the third than it does from the main to the natural. You're going to start a third base. All of this is allowing Azure to have a consistent game plan that goes from one base into rising two base while keeping up aggression into rising aggression to then maintain a third base. There's a lot that happens in the game after this, but it's a, a lot of it is a reflection of what happens as the interaction between two players. Therefore, it would probably not be best to copy this as if you were playing versus AI. So now we're going to go ahead and get the build that is on the other side of Azure's Hedgehog Expand in Azure vs. Theory Game 1. And that is actually going to be Theory's side of it. Now, Theory, whereas Parting had an Iron Vault Expand into Gaunt's, Theory is going to have Iron Vault Expand into a third, and we're going to talk about what happens there. It relies on you controlling your imps uh, somewhat intelligently, and getting away with a little bit of murder. But if you can do that, you will economically pull ahead of your opponent and cause them a lot of grief, while also making yourself reasonably open to damage, as we saw in the game itself. So Theory's Iron Vault Expand, this is the first part of two. All of the stats are written here. Again, this is for Broken Crown Hinterland specifically. You make an immediate Iron Vault, and then you send 12 imps on Luminite. Notice this is already different from Parting's Iron Vault Expand, and that we are not sending 10 on Luminite and then any number on Theory. At 58 seconds, you're going to send two imps from your main over to your natural with the purposes of damaging the three trees that guard the distance between the natural and the third base on Broken Crown Hinterlands. At 104, your first brute will finish, and then at about 114, a couple of seconds after your first brute finishes, this will all pack together pretty tightly, you're going to take one of those... <coughs> You're going to take one of those two imps and you're going to go build the shrine about six seconds later. And then you're going to clear out the second tree with one of your imps. Once you've done that, you want to make sure you go and make a meat farm on the high ground of your natural, which is at about 137. You will need to take another third imp and go finish off the last tree. Preferably it has one or two hits left before you can go into the natural. It's very important that you do this. As at 153, when your second brute finishes, you will then very quickly thereafter start a shroud stone on the high ground of your third base, and then two shroud stones 
runs on the high ground of your natural. The reason this is important, that imp getting done, is that there's going to be a small window during which you are attempting aggression and getting creeps out on the map with your second brute. But you need to make sure that you have something have cleared the space, and you really need to pay attention to getting that third base uh, tree line down so that you can make the shroud stone, in this case, to defend against the hedgehogs that will be coming, and can absolutely wreck your building if it is building when the hedgehogs show up as opposed to being finished. Now that's not quite the end of the build. So after the 212 double shroud stone on the high ground of your natural, you're going to go ahead and get a meat farm on the high ground of your third, and then you're going to, after all of the static defense has been put in place, at 253, start your third shrine. The interaction with the previous build is pretty interesting, actually. You're going to have your third shrine started by the time that your opponent's second hedgehog has come out if they're doing Azure's build. So you need to have the defense ready first, because otherwise you will take a lot of damage, and it may in fact be difficult for this to be accomplished. Keep in mind that there may be some difficulties in doing this, because this is a bit of a greedier economic opening. And while there was, again, a lot of game to be played uh, in Theory versus Azure after both of these builds happened, we're not really going to get into that, because that's the interaction of those two people, as opposed to... Uh, that's an interaction between those two people and in the game state as it manifested through micro and their individual battles and their decision making. Less so what you can do versus an AI. So we're going to get into a final one, which is going to be uh, Azure's Hedgehog Expect. We're going to do rather theories, uh, and, and forgive me for a second as I write this. So, so we're going to do, so the last game we want to cover actually, is Azure versus Theory Game 2. Now, in Azure versus Theory Game 2, we see Azure go for exactly the same build that he did in Game 1, but very quickly, the interactions between the two players get a little bit scuffed and a little bit funny. So, we're going to go ahead and look here at the build order for Theory's Shroudstone block. Now, this occurs at about... So, this is Game 2 between the Theory and Azure, and Azure is going for the same Hedgehog expand that he used previously. I want you to note what the timings here for are for what the Shroudstone block is on Theory's side. Keep in mind this is on Secluded Grove, which already has a pretty easy plan for Infernals in terms of blocking two main points, your choice of a set of two uh, choices of main points. And then once you block everything off, you can have a fairly easy three bases. Theory also follows up in a way that is very similar to what happened with the fast expand, but we'll get the timings here. So you start an immediate iron vault, and at 103 to 105, your brute will finish. You need to bring two imps along with the brute. One to feign that you are doing a, an expansion, and a second one and to kick off any uh, annoying scout, because you cannot afford to lose the real imp, and the second imp, which will become a shroud stone. Much like if you were just doing an iron vault expand, you send this unit, this brute, immediately across the other side the map to find out what damage you can do. If you find that your opponent has... Now, this is a very metagame build. What I mean by that is this. If you get to the other side with the imp and you find that your opponent is doing a fast expand, Bobs will be able to overrun the brute and then kick out the shroud stone. So you might be able to win, but you might also just lose a bru an imp and mining time and luminite for seemingly no benefit. Also, if your opponent is doing something like what we saw some of the streamers do yesterday, where they were making a lot of of units out of one racks while they continuously expanded in a slower, more controlled, perhaps safer uh, or safer feeling manner, then it's possible your opponent will have enough units that they don't have to really care about what your interaction point is with the Shroud Stone. Note, however, that because Azure was going for a Hedgehog expand, Theory's game plan, this meta build, worked absolutely perfectly. So at 119, you start your Shrine. Notice that this isn't meaningfully different than the Shrine timing you would otherwise have, and it's one of the reasons that you bring two Imps along initially instead of just one. Even though you set, miss a couple of trips of Luminite back and forth, it's not really that much as the Imp had to get on its way and go to the natural anyways. Might as well do that with the protection of the Brute. At 159, you're going to make a Shroud Stone with the Imp at the enemy natural. Keep in mind that your Brute's purpose here, it's raison d'etre, right, as if you were an Ergo Proxy fan, has to go around and make sure that your opponent's uh, army units and bobs do anything except investigate the natural. So that means in the case of Theory's particular game against Azure, he attacked the mech bay 
away because attacking into the mobs with overcharged surrounding and the build not working. He also, on seeing a couple of initial units start to attack him and the hedgehog pop out, did not path back towards the shroud stone. Rather, he pathed down into the right of it as far physically as possible from his opponents, uh, from his shroud stone, and then split the brood into fiends and attempted to get some damage and bought time against the hedgehogs in that way as well. When all of this came about and was said and done, we found that the Azure had two hedgehogs and was looking at a completed shroud stone outside of his natural that disrupted his ambitions for having map control and dealing economic damage to his opponent. Much like in the game that Theory made against Azure in game one, he has decided to set himself up with safety, two shroud stones and a meat farm at both chokes. There are two sets of chokes that you could use, but that's not the purpose of this video. If you watch the replay, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then at 3.11, only after the defenses have been set up, Theory grabs a third base. Now that what happens after this is because the gambit uh, or the open opening build or the meta call was successful, Theory goes on to absolutely crush with an overwhelming uh, economic advantage because it ends up very soon being a rising two base player against a three base, um, a three base Infernals player. So that's it. Those are the five builds I wanted to talk about. We're going to cut it here. There are more builds that I could discuss and give you the timings for, but YouTube has told me, hey Theory, how's it going man? I'm glad you like it. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and post this up on YouTube and make sure that people know what this is. Again, I want to add the caveat for anyone who wasn't here. You need to know, this is not necessarily what the build or the phase is going to look like for Stormgate. In fact, for reasons I'll go into in another video, it seems very likely that the changes to the build, that will happen for a variety of reasons, um, seems to have not particularly changed since about December 15th, up until a couple of days ago, barring people getting pointed to an old build, which can happen in software development. So don't expect that these timings will be the same, but do expect that some variation of these builds are going to be looked at, going to be investigated, and are going to be strong. Whether they actually work out in the next build or not, I'm not in the beta, remember? So there's no way of saying. But uh, I hope you found this useful. I'm going to port this over to YouTube. I'm going to try and make more short-form content, something that's more easily digestible for people. If you found this useful, you know what to do, right? All the social media links and whatnot. So this will be a short stream. I'll catch you later today when I gather more build information.